Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to Real Conversations, where it's my pleasure and privilege to have Mr. David Stockman talk to me about everything and anything that is central planning and his thoughts on the world currently. For those of you who don't know Mr. Stockman, he just wrote a fantastic book that you have to read, which is called The Great Deformation. He's also one of the few people that has, has an opinion that's actually informed from both a Wall Street perspective. He spent 20 years there. And before that, of course, he was a big time insider on the Reagan administration. So, uh, Mr. Stockman, first of all, thank you for taking the time to do this. Happy to be with you. I appreciate it. Great. Uh, so I wanted to like kind of bring it right up the middle and start okay. with, you've been one of the very few people who has not been shy <laughs> in calling what we have today a bubble. So I wanted to indeed just kind of like start with that and say, is it a bubble? How do you think about the bubble? Uh, and go from there. Well, it's a fantastic bubble. It's not of recent duration. I think it's been underway for decades. And it is a function or a consequence of rogue central banking that has fundamentally <clears throat> gotten off the deep end in terms of its impact on the financial systems, the capital markets, the money markets, and so forth. We no longer have honest price discovery anywhere in the markets. Everything is driven by the word clouds and the liquidity injections in the short run by not only the Fed, our central bank, but all the central banks of the world are doing the same thing. And as a result of that, all pricing is distorted. Mm -hmm. When you have zero interest rates in the money market, for 71 months running. That's where we are now. You think that Nothing. might create a distortion? <laughs> <laughs> well, what it is, it tells the carry trade, be, uh, go to it, yeah. Uh, because there is nothing like this that has ever been offered before. So day after day, they roll the trades, and the cost of carry is zero, and you find something with a yield. You find something that may have a short-term appreciation potential. Uh, you put the uh, trade on, and you laugh all the way to the bank. Uh, this is not leading to rational uh, discovery of the real risks and the real opportunities and the real facts that exist down the road in the future. So, uh, you know, we could talk about many different angles on that, but I say the most important price in all of capitalism is the price of money. Exactly. Because that's the cost of speculation. Mm -hmm. That's the incentive that drives the gamblers uh, in the financial markets. And if they face risk like they did with Volcker, they mm -hmm. could wake up some morning and the, the overnight rate would be up 300 basis points. <laughs> you would not uh, perform the same kind of uh, gambling maneuvers uh, in that environment as you do today. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think the word gambling is fair. Specula yeah. Speculation is sure. another derivative of that. But front-running the Federal Reserve, or front-running all these central banks, ECB, Fed, and, and, and BOJ have all cut to zero. So right. is, that, is, is the biggest bubble of all just the bubble in central planning? And once you get to zero, the right. bubble is at its basically its final or capitulating point? Yeah, I, I think it is. And I also think, uh, remember, uh, they're all driving not only the money market to zero, but they're trying to manipulate or manage the yield on the 10-year and the yep. entire curve in between. Well, what we know about capital markets is that almost everything, at least in the fixed income world, prices off the benchmark rate, which is the U.S. Treasury. So essentially, we have the whole junk world pricing off a phony rate. Mm -hmm. We have the entire corporate world, even investment grade, pricing at a spread off what is a manipulated non or sub economic rate. And then uh, that spreads around the world. That's why money uh, reaches for yield. That's why it goes into um, uh, emerging market debt, let's mm -hmm. say, without a real uh, risk reward uh, kind of calculation. And so very few people understand this very basic point because they always want to say the next crash or the next bubble has to be like the one that they just saw right. when in, indeed this is not anywhere near it. Uh, but it, the, the similarities are, are, are quite compelling which is you have someone who's marking something to model. You know, right. it right. could have been Lehman Brothers balance sheet then, now you have all these central banks marking the risk free rate to model, to an, to an unnatural rate. Right. So what you get is all these unnatural actions by Wall Street to create all these yield chasing vehicles. So for me, I'm, I'm looking at that now and I see Japan panics. Right. So the yen goes straight down, right. the dollar goes up, right. oil goes down, and one of the core yield chasing things, if you're following the bouncing is bubble. Energy high yield. Okay. Energy high yield yeah, right. MLP stocks. Right. Exactly. Right. So how do, do, is that how it starts to pop? Because some people say, what is the catalyst? And for me, it's already popping. 
Right. No, I agree with that. And the problem is the uh, money markets of the world, the capital markets are so complex, so deep, so interrelated and expansive that when you have fundamentally erroneous pricing at the center, the mm -hmm. money market rate, the carry trade at zero, mm -hmm. or the benchmark rate well below what supply and demand would produce in its own right, then you have trades being put on, you have speculations occurring that uh, are not visible uh, to the, uh, what I call the monetary politburo sitting in the <laughs> Eccles building, and suddenly, after uh, some unexpected shifts, they blow up and everyone says, where did this come from? No yeah. one was even focusing on uh, subprime or CDOs or CDO squared until uh, you know, the meltdown started in t uh, 207 and 208. And uh, all of a sudden, the issue was, where did all this come from? How did it happen? You know, what comet did it arrive on from outer space? <laughs> when actually, it was driven by the policy of the central right. banks uh, all the way through. So right now, I think we have trillions of speculation and emerging market debt that's a uh, you know, accident waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see it already, because as the dollar strengthens, there's going to be an outflow from some of these so-called high-yield currencies. As they suffer uh, capital outflows, their central banks will have to react, tighten interest rates, try to uh, you know, defend the currency. Uh, that will cause their yields to rise. That will cause investments that were made internally to get in trouble. Uh, and I think we can see you know, the possibility for that all over the world. My favorite, though, is in the, emer er, in the uh, energy high yield. Yeah. Energy high yield was uh, you know, something I didn't even hear about in the 1990s, and I was in the business. You didn't put that many uh, <laughs> junk bonds right, on uh, oil field plays. But today, it is the biggest single you know, booming sector of the junk market. Yeah. And uh, you know, there is a lot of talk about what a wonderful thing I it is that we're becoming energy independence. And, uh, fracking and sh the shale revolution, all that. There's a lot to it, but there is a uh, exaggerated flow of cheap debt into those uh, into that. Oh my sector. God! It's the most financially it, levered yeah, thing I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah. I mean, and uh, the problem though is that it's premised on uh, false economics. Yeah. Uh, that the oil price can stay at hundred dollars. Exactly. It's not given at all or that they can roll over this debt at these ultra low yields uh, mm -hmm. for, for time immemorial. Uh, I think neither of those are true. We can see it today. The price of oil is 77 and declining. Uh, if we have a worldwide recession, which I think is very likely, look at the status of Japan today. Look at uh, China. It's a house of cards uh, wanting to correct itself. Europe is dead in the water, and I don't see any way that they uh, emerge from that for a long time to come. So if we have a uh, uh, you know, uh, decline in the global uh, uh, cycle, uh, what is going to happen to the price of oil uh, for the next year or two or three? Yep. And where does that leave all of these uh, you know, high, uh, uh, high cost uh, shale uh, projects that have been funded uh, mm -hmm. with junk debt? You know, I'm all for risk taking. I'm all for the wildcatters. But no one in their right mind in the earlier days when I was in this business would have thought that something as risky as shale on the frontier uh, yep. provinces should be funded with, massively funded with high yield debt. Well, it's, just, it's the ultimate of a liquid carry trades. I mean, right. at the end of the day, yeah. and for those of you that don't know, um, Mr. Stockman was one of the founders at Blackstone, so he's not exactly unaware of what right. people would do with some yeah. leverage. But we've seen this, like, and, and I really get concerned about individual investors, because the way that they manifest this type of, of bubble is in MLP stocks. Right. So you'll get an upstream MLP right. that'll put five times leverage on their cash flow, which is kind of a made up number to begin with, right. to go out there and pay a dividend yield to the poor bastard who's just searching for yield. Right. So you're gonna end up in a place where all of Washington, I assume, is gonna say they didn't see this coming? I think that's exactly the phrase you're going to hear over and over. Where did this come from? It wasn't on our radar screen. <laughs> you, know, you have Janet Yellen sitting there allegedly with all these dashboards. What's on her dashboards? Well, it's a whole bunch of BLS statistics that are mostly a lot of noise in yeah. the short run anyway. You mean the 19 different yeah, indicators the 19 she has run? 19 indicators, <laughs> uh, and you know, you can't put any stock in the BLS numbers. For instance, the uh, you know, the headline jobs number every uh, once a month. 
uh, is apples and oranges and kumquats. I mean, it's, uh, it's short, crazy. you know, it's uh, part-time jobs, full-time jobs, high-paid jobs, low-paid jobs, temporary ones, more permanent. It doesn't measure anything that's meaningful, and yet uh, the Fed and Yellen and the rest of them are focused on all of this noise. I, in a blog that I did the other day, I put one number in there that I don't believe any central banker can explain, and it comes you know, from the horse's mouth, which is the BLS. If you look at hours, okay, not jobs, because you know, it's not yep. one man, one vote. If you look at labor hours supplied to the private non-farm business economy, you know, that, that's a fundamental uh, metric, let's say. Mm -hmm. And 1999, the index for that was 108. You know what it was in the third quarter of 214? It's 108. In other words, in 15 years, there has been no increase Nothing. other than minor little fluctuations in the amount of labor, hour con labor hours consumed uh, in the private economy uh, of the United States. So how do we get these job counts going up all the time? Well, because the jobs are becoming uh, uh, lower, they, they're becoming of lower and lower quality. Mm -hmm. There are more and more part-time jobs. Mm -hmm. There are more and more temporary jobs. There are more and more jobs without benefits. And what matters for the economy is the value added, the income produced, not some you know, headline uh, number uh, that's put out by the BLS. Well, why is this important? Because the Fed is basically managing the whole capital market, the whole money market, the financial system, with a view to uh, these few labor indicators without looking at what's going on in the nooks and crannies in this whole financial system as a result of the mispricing and the distortions uh, that stem from their uh, Well, what's amazing power. to me is that, number one, I agree with that, but uh, they entirely are discovering components of their policies output. But for example, you have multiple Fed papers now that outline that two thirds of the uh, two thirds of Americans have negative real wage growth. Right. So okay, yeah, shocking. Yeah. Now we have what two thirds to three quarters of the country uh, is in the highest cost of living period in American history. Right. Okay. And we have this complexion of hours worked all at the same time. Right. So for me, and we have Janet Yellen, by the way, giving speeches on inequality yes. and right. attending Parisian yeah. you know yeah. conferences in France on the same topic. Right. Do you think that this topic, to me all this just summarizes to inequality. Do you think that this topic was either in the midterm election results or is even possibly comprehended into the 2016 election as a real, you know, a real runnable topic that somebody could run the tables with? Yeah, I think what you saw in the uh, exit polls is people do not believe the story you get on the, uh, in the financial media. They think they're media. lying, exactly. Because uh, they, they can look around, they can look at their neighborhood, they can look at their friends, and there hasn't been a true recovery on the main street, mm -hmm. uh, in the main street economy. We're bumping along one or two percent growth if you believe the deflator, the GDP deflator, which I think is understated. Mm -hmm. So growth is probably even lower than uh, is, being, uh, is being published. But one or two percent is the natural capacity of what remains of our private uh, you know, uh, market system to produce. It doesn't take zero interest rates for 70 months. <laughs> it doesn't take massive monetization uh, of the uh, public debt or this huge expansion of the balance sheet to get one or two percent growth. The economy, uh, businessmen and workers and uh, consumers and uh, investors and so forth can do that on their own. So when they tell you, well, look, it's worked because the economy's you know, not stuck where it was in early uh, 2009, I say, you know, that's, uh, that's not causation, that's correlation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what is the uh, consequence of what they're doing actually, and that is it's mispricing all the financial assets, it's inflating the value of financial assets, fueling speculation, fueling uh, imbalance mm -hmm. uh, in the financial system that sooner or later uh, reaches the point where it b breaks down on its own accord. We have another panic. The economy goes back into the soup and we start over. Aren't we at the point, uh, I would say, for the third time this century? Yeah. Where we're on the uh, verge of another, another bubble busting and uh, another setback. And that, is that the I guess the perversity of politics is that you actually have to see this end in crisis for, for us to have any 
kind of regime regime change politically? Yeah, I think there has to be uh, you know a major uh, conflagration, a major dislocation of the financial markets that finally uh, repudiates uh, uh, you know or, or destroys the credibility. Mm -hmm of the people who are running the system. Because underneath the hood, I mean, if, if you have this thing called Twitter, or if you, right. God forbid, have an internet connection, you right. can figure out pretty quickly. And again, you've yeah. created a, a good website called The Contra Corner, where I highly suggest people go to. You can go there, and you can see that you know, David actually curates everything that he's reading so that you can see the other you know, different points of view. I don't see you popping Mr. Krugman's articles at the very <laughs> top. Like, I think you've written about extensively, and I've, I've also been pretty vocal about it, is that there's not a real big difference there really isn't an argument between Republicans and Democrats on monetary policy matters. I don't see that fair fight. I don't see anything but, you know, in fact, I thought Romney ran on basically yeah. a Keynesian economic yeah. policy, which was fully loaded with, yeah, we don't need to change anything with the Fed. Right. So who's going to run? Who's going to take the ball and, and mm -hmm. run, run it right up the middle on this, so to speak? Uh, I, I think that's unfortunate uh, that the Republicans um, didn't understand that their real enemy is the Fed, that it's run by Keynesians, that Keynesians <laughs> basically disagree with every single component of what was so, so Well, didn't you tell them that? Yes, uh, you know, you tell them that. Do they think uh, you're crazy? Uh, you know, the only, uh, yeah, I think that would be a fair <laughs> statement. Um, you know, they uh, are concerned about what the Fed is doing, but somehow they, uh, they believe that they can't take on the Fed uh, because uh, you know, it will um, you know, not go over well with the electorate. My answer is that when we have the next crash, the, Fed, the credibility of the Fed will be, in sh will be shattered, will be in tatters. Yeah. And then the politicians will come out of the woodwork. Rand Paul is already there, yeah. but the others will uh, jump on the bandwagon. Uh, but as like, I mean, as somebody who's like the whole lesson to me is you got to have somebody who's mainstream pointing out the obvious. I mean, the thing with the Pauls is that, like, in, in some respects, they don't, uh, for whatever reason, they're not going to apply to all the masses immediately. But why doesn't somebody like Jeb Bush just stand up and say, hey, look, my name's Bush, yeah. but I don't like the Fed. Right. I don't think the Fed's good for America. I think it perpetuates inequality. And I'm going to fire Janet Yellen. Well, uh, that would be, uh, you know. <laughs> That platform, I think, uh, would uh, ignite public opinion. Oh, big and, and time. And <laughs> yet, I'm not sure why uh, someone doesn't embrace it. The problem was the last Bush administration was full of Keynesians. Yep. Uh, you know, Romney's chief economic advisor said, I think Ben Bernanke's doing a great job. Yep. Maybe he should be reappointed. Was that Hubbard? Yeah. Oh, Glenn my Hubbard, God. Head of the business, you know, Columbia oh my God. Business School. Yeah. So uh, as a result of uh, basically what I call the business Keynesian influence in Republican policy councils, uh, there hasn't been an uh, effective critique and an effective opposition. But if I was, I'm <clears throat> Canadian, so I can't run. But yeah. I mean, and I wouldn't run. I, I, just, I, I, I think right. it's like vile you know, to go through the whole media experience right. of that. Right. But if you were to run, why wouldn't you say, hey, my name is Jeb Bush. I am very different from my brother and from my dad because I'm not a raging Keynesian. Right. And guess what? They were. And this right. is how they were. And explain right. to people, both fiscally and monetarily, how there wasn't a big difference between Nixon, Carter, and Bush and Obama. Right. You know, there's two big decades in this country that have the same American zeitgeist or mistrust. People can't seem to put their finger on it until a leader mm -hmm. articulates precisely what the difference was, like Reagan did. I mean, yeah, I think the issue now is the Fed has been inflating this bubble. This is the third one. Uh, after all, uh, people uh, that uh, you know thought the Fed had their back and bought, drank the Kool-Aid are now up 200 percent from the bottom. Yeah. All right. And so some of them recovered their losses. <laughs> yeah. Some of them recovered their losses. Some of them didn't. Uh, but my point is, as long as that bubble is inflating, the politicians are going to be loath to take on the institution uh, behind it. Yeah. So when the bubble breaks, that will be the time to come in and say, we spent five years destroying savers with 0% mm -hmm. interest. We spent five years taking the balance sheet up by then roughly $4 trillion. That's mm -hmm. just monetizing the debt. Mm -hmm. That's fraud. That's what that is. We spent five years uh, allowing the gamblers to have huge windfalls and thereby tilting the distribution of income and wealth even more completely 
uh, towards the top 1% or whatever you want to call it. Some politician, and, and what did we do for Main Street? We did very little for Main Street because the amount of what I would call full-time or breadwinner jobs uh, is not even back to where it was in 2007. And we screwed them with okay. the highest cost of living in U.S. Yeah. history. Okay, and we have, uh, <laughs> you know, and the cost of living has gone up and the Washington doesn't measure it. It pretends it's not there, but the public knows it. So uh, if, uh, you know, if when the bubble bursts, uh, there will be uh, a politician yeah. who will come along who will talk about the destruction of savers, who will talk about the coddling of Wall Street and the gamblers, uh, who will talk about the failure uh, of this policy uh, to really uh, generate any traction in the real economy. Now, do you, why, does it have to, why can't it happen before that? Why can't a politician perpetuate the pop or the blow up? Why can't we have a Reagan moment in that regard? Well, the Reagan moment I remember well because I was there, <laughs> but the point was the Reagan moment came in 1980 after inflation had after. already reached. Mm -hmm. 13, 14 percent on a run rate basis on the CPI. After the well, now AI, they've just changed the calculation nine times <laughs> since 1996, so you don't have to you ever see that, it again. That's true, but <laughs> I think the lesson is that Reagan capitalized on the total destruction of credibility to the Keynesian mainstream on fiscal policy that had been embodied right. uh, in uh, the Carter uh, policies and uh, that had been uh, the uh, policy of the Fed mm -hmm. under Arthur Burns uh, and Miller. Uh, so Reagan got uh, lucky because we had Paul Volcker who had the fortitude and the vision uh, uh, to, to uh, stare inflation in the face uh, and uh, bring it down. Uh, but there was a crisis that gave Volcker the opportunity to have the latitude yep. to do what he did and there was a crisis that gave a uh, outsider perspective, like Reagan had in the 1980 election, a hearing, some resonance with the public. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as they can say, well, the economy has had a good quarter at 3% for getting the negative <laughs> first quarter or taking the inventory out of it, we've been bumping along at 2% year over year on real final sales for four years running. There is never, we've never had the escape velocity they keep talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we're creating essentially temporary and part-time and born-again jobs. We finally have gotten to the point where there are more uh, headline jobs today than there were in December 2007. Uh, since the year 2000, the, even the headline number has only grown at 0.3% a year for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Now how can you grow an economy with a headline number at 0.3% on jobs and with labor hours, the real metric that determines you know, the labor input, which is half of uh, economic growth, at zero mm -hmm. over time for 15 years. I mean, it's a repudiation of Keynesian economic policy, which right. both Bush and Obama had two cracks at and doubled right. down both times. I mean, right. So now you have this election. And maybe it's just too late. Maybe somebody doesn't get it or they don't have the spine to run on it. Yeah. I don't see it. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it in the marketplace. I don't see it. Uh, in terms of a, an absolute expectation, I sit down with a lot of institutional investors. Like if I throw, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, thank right. God. But I mean, if I sit there and say the word Bush, I mean, they're going to want to leave the room. Right. I mean, there's a lot of angst out there. There's a, actually a political disgust. And what I want to ask you about that is how the media plays into this. Because the media has kind of taken someone like you. Your book was fantastically right. successful. Uh, Paul Krugman was explicitly yeah. negative right. uh, about what it is that you said. I mean, the Financial Times, and I quote, Stockman is distinctly angry with a lot to say. I mean, you have a lot of people out there that want to kind of condemn what people like us are doing with right. almost like ad hominem attacks. Right. Like, how do you well, think well, about that? Well, they do that because I think deep down they know that what we're saying is right. <laughs> I mean, how can you create wealth simply by uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, credit out of thin air at the Fed and allowing the balance sheet to grow uh, to this magnitude because what it's fraud really when they buy we call it a Ponzi scheme same yeah, thing yeah well when yeah. they buy three and a half trillion dollars <laughs> worth of federal debt and GSC uh, debt that debt originally funded labor uh, inputs uh, capital uh, consumption uh, real economic resources 
and it was paid for out of uh, you know credit uh, created out of thin air. Well, people don't. If, if that was a viable uh, strategy, why should anyone work? Why yeah. should we have taxes? Let's well, is, it is by definition, like we explain the Ponzi scheme to really, sim uh, really simple terms. You know, the, the Treasury issues paper, the Fed buys that paper, right. the Treasury pays the Fed, and then the Fed gives the money back. Right. So it's just one it's just big like circle. A, yeah, it's yeah. just a gigantic yeah. circle. Right. So, but again, back to the point about the, the media. The damage is done along the way. This oh, is tons the of important damages. thing. Because but the media was, doesn't characterize yeah. it that yeah. way. Like, does right. that drive you nuts, or you just become yeah. your own media? Well, I'm so you know you get so used to it after a while. What I call <laughs> you know really the recency bias uh, of the uh, media that they have no, they don't even remember what happened in 2008 or 2009 anymore, right? <laughs> Um, that why wouldn't you be, if you were in the media, you're supposed to be in the investigation business. That was the old yeah. idea of what journalists did. Why aren't they now looking for the next CDOs, the next sure. CDO squares, the next derivative uh, uh, or uh, over-the-counter uh, 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 little uh, complexities that are going to blow up uh, when uh, the environment changes? That's what they should be doing. What's fascinating about that is that they get so enamored with books like The Big Short, which is basically that. It's an investigative journalist story right. or an investigative analyst. What's the difference, by the way? It's the same thing. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we'll write a, a, a drop down on an MLP related equity and its bonds, and we'll get vilified by these people. Like right. we're creating a bear raid or whatever it may be. Yeah. But I mean, it really is a point in time that I, I, I certainly haven't seen in this country. Do you think there's any way that that will change? Or we're just going to have this dogmatic media that's very short term with no historical context? Uh, I think it'll change as soon as it stops working. I mean, in other words, on a short-term basis, <laughs> yeah. the media says uh, they're lazy. Uh, they uh, simply regurgitate what their, their sources uh, supply to them or the press releases that come their way. Uh, and so if the uh, Europeans say that they're desperately fighting the incipient threat of deflation, uh, that's what the FT writes, <laughs> that's what Reuters <laughs> write. Rights and you know why is uh, one percent uh, uh, reduction in the value of purchasing power such a uh, you know uh, terrible thing? Yeah, because <laughs> it could be two, three, or four. In other yeah. words, um, uh, it, it's a short-term bias that will change when things blow up. Because mm -hmm. last time things blew up, then they were all over the case. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, there's two different, and 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 maybe it's a kind of a good way to wrap up this right. conversation. I've thought of this in as many ways as I possibly can. How does it end? And you're saying it either it, it can explicitly end in a crash and or like another thing we've been thinking a lot about is a generational shift mm -hmm. where you've basically disqualified baby boomers both politically and economically in terms of their academic frameworks. And you have Gen X and really millennials right. that come along and say, look, yeah. I'm not going to be lied to. I saw my parents get lied to and I'm going to vote for something else. I think, uh, yeah, that's the only real hope you have because um, uh, the, the mainstream establishment has gotten so hooked on what I would call the free lunch. We can run deficits. We don't have to worry about financing them. We can have the Fed print the money, hold interest rates towards zero, and hope it's all going to work out for the best. That's what the mainstream narrative uh, is today. Uh, it isn't sustainable. Uh, and uh, as I said, until we get a major dislocation, uh, we're not going to have a different regime. Yeah. And, I, and I really appreciate your work on this. I mean, you've done a, cr a tremendous job for your country. Your book was fantastic, so Great. congratulations on that. If you haven't read uh, Mr. Stockman's book, again, it's called The Great Deformation. You can find me on Twitter, and you can also find Mr. Stockman there, too. Thank you.